Now comes the second part which is algebra and uh, well you are more or less right about algebra when you say that you know you have these variables that come up, symbols that come up and that is how you describe an algebra, right. But you have done more sophisticated algebra than that, maybe not in a formal setup which is why you do not recognize it. How many of you have heard of something called sigma algebra? Sigma algebra, I am assuming you have done a course on advanced probability or something stochastic processes or something of that sort where you encountered this. Do you recall what a sigma algebra is? Sir, addition of some subsets of a given set. Right. You have to obey certain uh, process, I mean 50 percent is a complement of the Right, right, thank you. So basically what he said there, there are two important components. It is a collection of objects. So you have to first have some object on which you define an algebra and then you have a set of operations which are legitimate which are well defined, which you can carry out and then you set a rule base, right. You impose that, that gives it a structure. So a sigma algebra for instance, a sigma algebra, you have a set A and you have a set U which is a collection of subsets of A, A. Okay, such that, so these are symbols by the way, get used to these, looking at these symbols, such that if A i, A i is a member of this collection of subsets, okay. If A i belongs to U, then the complement of A i must also belong to U, that is the first rule. Okay. The second rule is, this is 1, the second rule is if countable unions, okay, countable unions of subsets of A, uh, sorry, if I, I should say if A i belongs to U, then the countable unions of the subsets must also belong to U and so should the countable intersections. So if AI belongs to U, you do not need to copy these, I am just writing them for the sake of completeness, this is not something we shall be dealing with in this course. I am just giving you an example of an algebra that you are familiar with. So this is an intersection of AI, must also belong to Okay. This is the rule. So there are a few terms which we have already introduced and that is the reason we learn about definitions in mathematics. What is countable? Does anyone know what is countable? There exists a mapping between countable set with uh, integer and uh, set of integers. Set of integers. Is a set of rational numbers countable? It is not. Okay. Yeah, we will actually be dealing with such things about mappings and showing that if there are two sets contain an equal number of elements or not, yeah, if there is some structural similarity between sets and stuff and the like, we will we'll get into those concepts of course pertaining to linear algebra, not in a very generic sense of analysis or topology or things like that. But anyway, so thank you for that answer. So you can have countable infinities and you can have uncountable infinities as, as it turns out, right. There are infinities and bigger infinities and so on and so forth. So the infinity of the set of uh, integers is denoted by aleph naught. So a symbol that you might have encountered somewhere, aleph naught, okay. That is the set of infinity, that is the infinity of the countable set. Anyway, uh, this is a bit of a digression. The point is that there is a set of rules. So if you have a set and you cook up the collection of all subsets, okay collection of all subsets of A and then if they follow this rule such that if the set A i comes from this union, the complement must also come from there. By the way, this is not a very trivial operation complementation, is it? Uh, is any one of you aware of certain paradoxes and certain contradictions in set theory? Yes, uh, set of concepts that do not contain. Yeah, do you know the name of that paradox? Okay, not very important. Yeah, it is Russell's paradox. 
Can you explain? Does anybody remember what, what it was, is all about? Right. Right. Okay. So, when you talk about these operations, they have to be well defined. And as one of your classmates has pointed out, or rather clarified Russell's paradox for us, you see, if you have a set, yeah, and if you consider the set of all those sets which do not contain themselves, that, that's like almost every other set, right? A set of oranges, yeah? Is it an orange? It's not, right? A set of oranges is an object, is a, is a construction that we have created. It's not an orange, right? So a set of, when you, when you cook up this sort of an object, so is, it a mem is a set a member of itself? So there are things you call a set normal if it's not a member of itself. And you say call a set abnormal if it's a member of itself, okay? So as, as your friend pointed out just a while back, that you take a look at all these sets that are not contained in themselves, right? So are they normal or abnormal, right? So think about all those collections of sets which are not contained in themselves, right? So you have, for example, uh, the original set, let's say one, two, three, yeah? And you cook up the set of all subsets. What are those? It's one, two, three itself. It's one, two, three. And then you can have like take two out of these. And then of course you have to end up with the empty set two. Right? So this set looks quite different from any of the sub subsets individually, right? It's a different object altogether, you agree, right? Because that is where the first understanding of this comes from. As I said, the orange and the set of oranges, they're completely different objects, right? So now if you define something like in a contradictory manner, in a very layman's language, suppose there's a village where you have, a, you have set a rule base. So all this contradiction comes from how you set the rule base. So in a village, if you have the following rule that there's exactly one barber, and every man in the village, no one has a beard, okay? So the condition is that every man either shaves himself or he gets shaved by the barber. The question is who shaves the barber? Look at the rule, the rule itself contradicts it, right? It's either or, you cannot have both. So you either shave yourself or you get shaved by the barber and nobody keeps a beard, it's not allowed. So what does the barber do? If he shaves himself, but then he's the barber. He cannot shave himself and get shaved by the barber at the same time. See the contradiction there, right? So this, con this kind of a contradiction is very obvious in set theory. So you have to be alive to these nuances when you're dealing with certain kinds of objects. Thankfully, we shall not be dealing with all these things, so we shall not go crazy thinking about all of these ideas. But it's once in a while important to understand why things need to be well defined and why we must understand the limitations of what our definitions are, right? If something is embedded within the theory itself, there's nothing you can do. That contradiction is kind of there. You cannot evade it. It's, it, it's part of naive set theory, right? Whenever you define something over it, this contradiction will always exist, all right? So moving ahead with all of these contradictions, we will nonetheless try to still keep our focus, eyes on the ball as they say, right? Keep our focus on solving systems of linear equations. And just because I said that we'll not talk about specific applications, excuse me, because you know, this is after all a course with a double E tag to it. So I'll just show you an, one application, which I'm sure every one of you has encountered maybe in your plus two courses, where you have solved linear equations, yeah? Which is nothing but a circuit containing just resistances. Straightforward application. So let's call this R1, R2, R3, R4, all right? And we want to solve for currents in this circuit. Of course, you might argue just use series parallel, you know, simplifications and just solve for the current 
why go into this business? Well, I just want to illustrate to you that this lends itself to the formulation of what we call system of linear equations. So what we will call is this current as I1 and this current as I2 and this as a voltage source V. So the first equation of course then becomes what is it? I1 with a coefficient R1 plus R2 minus I2 with a coefficient R2 and the second equation there is no voltage source in this loop. So of course this side you have 0, maybe I should put it the other side where you get the idea. So this what will, what will it have? Minus R2 I1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 I2, right? What are the unknowns? The currents are the unknowns, the voltage is known. So I might jolly well write this equation in the following manner whose entries I leave it to you to fill up. Of course there is nothing really to it. Right? So this is an equation of the form Ax is equal to B. Right? That is what we shall be trying to solve. That is problem 1, not the circuit but this is the first problem we will be solving in this course. Okay. Much of the course in fact probably up to 60 percent to 3 quarters of this course will consider problems like this and how to get an answer to solving this problem. Okay. There is another problem which we shall try to solve in this course whose motivations I shall not introduce right away. I will introduce it only as and when we shall be dealing with it because there is a concern that you might not remember it by the time uh, I actually deal with that problem. But that is the so called eigenvalue eigenvector problem which is of the form Ax, maybe I should use the same x. From next class I will use just little x here. Ax is equal to lambda x where again x is an unknown but apart from that lambda is also an unknown. Okay. So these are the two problems we shall solve in this course. All right. We have already seen one example just to keep things light and not very heavy. I will give you another example. We will not get into any technical details or any mathematical rigor today. I will just give you one more example and let us see how much time we have. Depending on that we will maybe delve into another. And again excuse me because this is also com somewhat coming from uh, my experience with electrical systems and electrical engineering. Uh, but I am sure again anyone who has done a course on basic physics which is everyone presumably in this class you would also find it familiar. So you know this equation that we come, come across in field theory which says that what the gradient of the potential yeah, is equal to what? The field right? The field intensity is not it? And what else? What is the divergence of this? No, no this is electrical, electrostatic, this is not magnetic, this is electrostatic. It is rho, it is rho right, it is the charge density, yeah, it is just rho. So if you combine these two together, what you end up with divergence of the grad, it is what we call the Laplace's equation, right. So what we have is this, this is nabla, the symbol is nabla. So you take this Laplacian of the potential and you end up with the charge density. Now this is what you are looking to solve. What does this generally look like? If you have three dimensions, this nabla squared kind of thing is defined in the following manner. Right? 
Rings a bell? Looks a little familiar, I'm sure, right? So suppose we ignore the, the third part of this and we only consider a plane or a sheet on which we want to calculate the potential, right? Then we have to solve for this two dimensional Laplace equation. So we have to solve, uh, we have to solve something like We have to solve for this and let us say the region over which we want to solve for this is given like so, right? So of course, it is not very straightforward to solve for this. Uh, computationally, we think of solving this as kind of creating grades or tessellations to this entire region like this. And then if we have a lot of computational resources on our hands, we will create finer and finer tessellations because we do not mind having lots and lots of variables to calculate. If on the other hand computational power is at a premium, then we take coarser tessellations, coarser grids and we say okay, there is a lot of margin for error. I mean it is like if you, if you dish out more money, I will give you clearer and better results. But if you do not have that much computational capability, you are only going to get coarser results. That is basically what it is. So then it turns out that we have to discretize this equation in space, right? So let me not just draw this like a parallelogram. Let me just draw this like a grid as if you are looking at it from a top, the top view of this. And take a small toyish example oh again the poor artist in me is showing its true colors Right? There is a reason why I have drawn them in two different colors. It will be clear in a while. The point is how do we now formulate this problem? We want to solve for the potentials at different different points on this grid. Right? We can measure the charge density let us say or we are given the charge densities. How do we solve this problem? Turns out it will be a linear system of equations. Let us just give it a name. Let us call this point as P. Q, R and S, all right? And let us say the potential at this point is VP, VQ, VR and VS, all right? And let us say this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Let us just take the sample point P and pass it through the discretized version of this equation. Shall we? So what is the discretized version of this? What do you think it is? What is a gradient after all? It is just a substitute for a differentiation which is when in the discretized form a difference, right? So if I do take the gradient of this, it is just VQ minus VP. But if I take the divergence of that gradient, what do you think it's, is that going to be? Is the difference between VQ minus VP and VP minus V5 along the x direction plus I will also have to account for the y direction. So what should I write? The first sample equation for the point VP is going to be as follows VQ minus VP minus VP minus V5 that takes care of the x direction plus uh, V R minus V P minus or let us say upward we go is the higher direction. So it is V 2 minus V P 
minus V P minus V R is equal to rho at P. What is known and what is unknown here? And how many equations should I write? It turns out that is where the domain knowledge of the problem comes in, which is why I cannot teach you very specific applications because my own knowledge is limited by the kind of problems that I have handled in my life, right. It turns out in this case, you will know the potentials at these points. Why? What is the argument? Those are the boundary points. So it is a boundary value problem. You would know what the values of the potentials at these points are. There are essentially four unknowns here. Yeah, there are four unknowns and you will cook up equations for all four of those, right? You will know the charge densities at each and every point. So the terms that sort of pretend to be potentials and therefore unknown are not really unknown. Terms such as V5, terms such as V2, you will have to know how to massage this equation in a proper fashion so that you end up with a system of linear equations that contain four unknowns and they are four in number. So you set up this Laplace's equation for all four of these points considering that you know the values at the boundaries, right? And if that sounds like, oh, that is too much knowledge, I know the value at 12 points, I am just figuring out the value at, uh, you know, four points, it is like an overkill. Then I urge you to consider a finer grid that is 200 cross 200 and consider the number of unknowns and the number of knowns at the boundary point. Yeah, probably that would make it more meaningful. Yeah, so that is clearly another example of where Ax is equal to B kind of equations are useful, which is why again we are justified in engaging or devoting our energies behind this course. Okay, any questions as of now from anyone? This one? So what is this? If you take, for example, a function, let us say this function, what is the first derivative of this function? First derivative of this function is the slope at a point. What is the second derivative of this function? It is the rate of change of the slope. So for instance, you can have a function that is growing like this. This function is an increasing function because its slope at all of these points is positive. On the other hand, you have another function that is also like this, that is also an increasing function. Where do you see the difference between these two? If you take the second derivative, in this case, the function is increasing, so is its slope. In this case, the function is increasing, its slope is positive, but its slope is decreasing. So the second derivative is negative, right? I urge you to look at this as something like the second derivative. So what is the second derivative doing? The first derivative is telling me about its tendency, how this thing is varying, how this potential is varying across the space. So that will be told by the difference between VQ and VP. But what is the rate of increase or decrease of this slope? That can be said by how much has it differed between point P and Q and how much did it differ between point 5 and P? Was this increase more or less than this, right? So that is what this second difference is. In fact, if I write this in a compact fashion, I would have, sorry, that was VQ plus V5 minus 2 VP. And this also I can write minus 2 VP. That is generally the pattern, right? So if you are interested in not formulating this as four equations in four unknowns. And if you want to write all those potentials pretending as if these are all unknowns, then you will end up with a system of equations where you have 16 variables. So you have a four cross 16 matrix, right? Of course, there will be constraints because many of those variables will be known, right? But you can formulate this as four cross four, you can formulate this as four cross 16. It is a matter of taste but you are solving essentially the same problem, right?